Well, it's a joy to be here. It's a joy to be preaching. This is what the Lord's called me to do, and I love it. It uh, can be a scary thing when you're not prepared, but I'm prepared tonight. Praise the Lord for that. If you would take your Bible, we're going to be in the book of Mark this evening. Book of Mark. I've been studying in my personal devotions through the book of Mark. I try to make it a frequent thing as I go through the Bible uh, studying on my own. I try to make it a frequent thing to always come back to one of the gospel records, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Just touch base because that's where Jesus is at. Jesus is all throughout the book of the Bible. You know, he's everywhere. He's in every book in every simple way. But the words of Christ are lettered in red, and there's a bunch of those right there in those books. So I try to make sure I get back there close and often. So we're going to be in the book of Mark chapter number 5. pastor told me that I would be preaching on July 4th, and it's the first time I've ever had to been put in a position where I'm preaching on a holiday or around a holiday, and as he says, sometimes the holidays kind of pick the topics for the, themselves, and it's Independence Day. I, I'm proud to be an American. I love my country. I love my church. I love my Lord, and all of this is just a great day, but the, today's message is going to reflect a little bit on our position here as Americans. I'm thankful for our independence and for 200 and I think it's 42 years that we're, we've been a nation. But as we look at this, I pray that we would all keep an open mind and we would see what God has for us. There's some application here in this story that affects us deeply. Let's begin reading just in the first few verses of Mark chapter number 5. We're going to work our way through the majority of the chapter, but we'll do it little by little. The Bible says in Mark chapter number 5, And they came over into the other side of the sea, unto, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him on the t out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Let's begin right there. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I need your help. I pray that you would empty me of myself and of any aspiration that the devil or my flesh would put up to try to hinder this message or this message spoke to me first and i'm excited about it but I, lord i pray that you would get a hold of hearts that are here i'm thankful for faithful church members that are here on a night when most would be somewhere else dear lord we thank you so much for this passage i pray that you would fill me with your spirit and your power and help me to say what you'd have me say in jesus name i pray amen I've entitled this message, Jesus in Our Country. As you know, the, um, Jesus, at the beginning of this chapter here, verse number one, Jesus and his disciples arrive on shore, and the Bible says immediately, here comes this maniac come running up to him. We call him the maniac of Gadara. He's, we find his story here in Mark. We find it in Matthew. We find it in Luke. This man is uh, he's naked, to be honest. He's a scary sight. He's crazy. He's driven by something other than himself. He's full of demons. And he's come running up to Jesus as soon as he steps out of the ship, and the Bible actually gives us a little bit of context about his life. The other books, they talk a little more about just him coming up and the encounter he had with Jesus. But we have a few verses to talk about him. It said that uh, there were times when people would try to chain him and he broke the chains. I don't know any man that can break chains, but this man could. It, they said he would put his feet and his arms in fetters and locks and he would break those asunder. People tried to tame him, tried to work with him, tried to help him get through this difficult time when he had a demon possessing him. But it was to no avail. Another account over in the book of Luke says that they tried to clothe him, but he would have none of that either. This man was crazy. He was n wasn't even himself. It was the demons controlling him. It, it dro drove him out into the wilderness. It drove him out into the tombs. It drove him away. Those tombs were close to a road, and this is uh, a place where thieves would lurk. It was a dangerous place. As travelers would come towards Gadara, he would jump out and attack them, I imagine so. That's the kind of environment he found himself in. The devil had his mischief planned with this man. Right. But first, let's look at some introduction. This man has an amazing story. It sticks out. We all learned it in Sunday school. We were familiar with it. But let's look at a little bit of introduction. If you would go to the chapter right before it, chapter 4, and look with me in verse number 35. Jesus with his disciples says, And the same day when they were e when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind. 
and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and sea obey him? I want you to understand, the Lord cares about our condition. He, can, he cares about us very, very personally. God's, our God's a very personal God. He's very close. He, he, he knows exactly what's going on in each and every one of our lives. Whether one of us is lost, we don't know Christ as our Savior, we are not one of his children, or we are. Regardless of where you stand, the Lord knows it all. He knows exactly where you're at. And these men, his disciples, these men that have gone with him all over the place, they run to him in the middle of a storm, and rather than saying, hey, Master, stop the storm, rather than saying, stop the wind, stop the waves, aren't you getting wet? How can you sleep through this? Rather than saying anything like that, they say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you even care about us? What's wrong with you? That would be a little bit insulting to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because, yes, he cares. The whole reason why he's there is because he cares. I'd like to remind us, God cares about man's condition. Not only does he care about his condition, but he cares about his faith. And that's when he addressed them. He's talking to the disciples, says unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? He's been addressing and talking to them about faith. He's been speaking in parables, and then he'd pull his disciples aside, and he would talk to them, and he'd expound the parable to them in a deeper meaning and give them the spiritual truths, and he was building their faith, building their knowledge. And he says, how is it you have no faith? You are scared in this moment. Our Lord cares greatly about our man's condition, about our condition. He cares about our faith in him, and he's willing to show himself mighty so that we will have more faith in him. He showed himself mighty and just in the drop of a hat right there, caused this, the wind and the seas and the storms, it caused everything to calm down. And this is right before they're going to show up in Gadara. This is just the night before, the day before, hours before, minutes before. How, I don't know how long it was, but this is right before they land in Gadara. And these people, these dis- disciples are with them. They've seen him work with other people, heal the lame, heal the blind. They've seen him do some amazing things. They just saw one thing they'd never seen before, and they saw him calm a sea, calm, calm the storm, stop everything just in the snap of a finger. Just as one word, it was done. Their faith was greatly increased, and they're about to see something else that they'd never seen before. See, God cares about more than one man. He cares about one man the same way he cares about an entire nation. I keep talking about a nation or a country. I've entitled this message, Jesus in our country, because he's in the country of Gadara. A little bit of a background about this place. Gadara was not actually the town that they were in. He was over on the southeast coast of the Sea of Galilee. Gadara was six miles away. This is the closest large town. If you read in the account of the book of Matthew, it talks about another town, a smaller community, I think by the name of Gennesaret or something. It, it starts with a G as well. It's uh, similar, but it's not the same thing. It's a smaller little community closer to the sea. And these cities were built up with a lot of commerce, a lot of trade. There's a lot of Greek people there, a Greek influence. This is modern-day Syria. Most of these cities are. And uh, Jesus cares about them. He's there to do a work. He's there to minister to them. And I'd like for us to consider about our nation as we look at this nation. First off, there's trouble in our nation, just as there's trouble in this nation. And the source of the trouble is the devil himself. The trouble that we see in our nation here in America today isn't because we have an ungrateful generation or the generation before them was ungrateful. The problem is because the devil is attacking us. The devil is behind all of this. Our enemy isn't another man. Our enemy is the devil himself. And this land, this country, this this region of, uh, what is it? Yeah, the Gadarenes, of Gadara, this region right here, they're dealing with an issue of a man that is possessed with devils. They tried to help him. They tried to they, chain him. They tried to figure, you know, if we can bind him up, maybe eventually he'll calm down and he breaks through them. They tried to tame him, but he would have no instruction. Nothing would solve anything. They tried to clothe him. They tried to make him blend in and look like the rest of them, and maybe he would just fix him. They couldn't fix him. We all have our solutions to our own problems. No amount of self-control could have saved this man from the problems he was facing. He had a spiritual problem. We have a spiritual problem in our nation. We, we can try to cover it up. We can try to uh, fabricate some sort of solution all we want to the problems that we're facing on a large scale, on a political side or on a government side, a social side, problems within our homes. We can come up with our own solutions all we want, but the solution that we need is the same solution this man needed, and that was Jesus. We need Jesus as a solution here. See, his problem affected the whole countryside. As you read, you find that 
in the middle of the night, they could hear him cutting himself and crying. That's not anything that a normal man would do. Not even a troubled man would do that every night and every day. This de- these devils are tormenting this man. He's possessed. It's such a sad thing. The people tried to help him. They did care about him. But I wonder, I'm careful not to speculate too much on what the Bible doesn't say, but I wonder if it just became a normal thing to them. Oh, we just that's the maniac out in the tombs cutting himself again. I wonder if they just got comfortable with it or they just start, learned to ignore it. I, I don't know. And I'm not even suggesting that that's what happened. But I do know that they did try to help him, but there was nothing that could fix it. And that our problems are th- in our nation are the same. That the problem that they were facing is that the devil was attacking them and the devil was working. And God knew it. And God was ready to step in and make a change. To some extent, man is willing to even live with these problems. This man that was possessed with the devil, we don't have his name. His name is not important because what God is going to do is important. But the, he could do nothing about his condition. He, he really couldn't. He couldn't get the devil out of him at all. The devil will do anything to keep his work of mischief and wickedness continuing. And he has a great work that he's doing in the land of Gadara. It's massive. We, we read other accounts of people that were possessed with demons, but you're going to see in just a moment how many demons were actually inside this one man and the amount of control he had and the, the whole reason that he was infecting this one man there in Gadara. We have trouble in our country, as I've said. They have trouble in their country. And the trouble is always rooted back to the devil. Let us always remember that. Second, not only is our trouble in the country rooted back to the devil, but the Lord has an answer for all of our trouble here in our country. He is the answer himself. When the, Lord was ha- when the Lord has his way, miraculous results are in store. Look with me, if you would, over in verse number 6, Mark chapter number 5. The Bible says in verse number 6, But when he saw Jesus, talking about the maniac, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. I, I sat there and I wondered as I read that passage, could it be that the, the demons just couldn't help themselves because they worship, they know who God himself is, and they drove this man to him? Or if the man of his own understood that that was Jesus... That was the son of God, the one who could help him. I don't know, but he knew whether it was him or the demons. When they got to the feet of Jesus, they knew what they had to do, and they knew they had to worship. The Bible says again in verse number 7, And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? These are the demons talking. Thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. When he calls him the son of the most high God, that most high God, that that name is, uh, I wrote down here, Elion. That's what these... Gentiles, these are these people that live in this, this region, the mo- majority of them are not Jews. That's what they knew the God of the Israelites as, the most high God. He's higher than the other gods, and he is. And these demons even address him to that, thou son of the most high God, what do you have to do with me? He says, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. These demons knew exactly what the Lord was doing. They, exactly, they knew exactly who he was. He's the son of God, and they know their end. These demons know they're in that they're going to face torment and hell forever and ever and ever. And they say, hey, it's not time yet. It's not the end of the world yet. Don't, what are you doing here? What are you trying to do to us? And they adjure him. They, they urge him, please don't torment us. Because he said unto them, come out of the man. The Lord cares about the man. The Lord cares about the entire nation. The Lord cares about this problem. He's aware of this. Just as he showed back to his disciples back in the ship, yes, he cares. People wonder, does God care? God does care. He cares about this one man. He says, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And then the the spirits start to speak, and they say, "Uh, why are you going to torment us? What are you going to do to us? Please, don't don't do this. They're speaking to Jesus, and he asks them, this is interesting, what is thy name? The only time that the Lord ever asks a question is not because he needs the answer, but because somebody else does. The Lord asks this question to this demon, what is thy name? I didn't know that demons had names to be honest, and uh, we only know of a handful of angels that have names, and we know the demons are fallen angels. I was wondering, why is he asking him his name? And we know that his name is Legion. Legion refers to a a group of soldiers in the Roman military, and I did my research, it's at least 6,000 men. Some even say it's exactly 6,826 soldiers. In the the Roman uh, military, 6,100 would be infantry, and the other 726 would be cavalry, a very large uh, force. You know, it's not just a large group of people, a large group of soldiers there to do warfare. 
And that's what these demons are equated with. He said, my name is Legion, for we are many, there in verse 9. Why is that important? Why would the Lord call that out? Why would the Lord bring light to, that, to this? Because there's people watching. The people watching are his disciples. These are the same disciples that said just a moment ago, carest thou not that we perish? And then he shows them his mighty power over all nature, over storms and waves and wind. He shows them the power, and now he's going to show them power not over one demon, not two demons, not five, but a surplus of 6,000 or more at one time. And they're all trembling in fear because they're afraid that the Lord Jesus is about to send them down to hell for their eternal torment. He demonstrates his power to these men, to the maniac, the man who's possessed with them. He's sitting there, front row seat, seeing, hearing the conversation that's going between them, everything. And he sees that he has 6,000 plus demons inside of him. And the Lord is addressing it and saying, what is thy name? And the Bible says in verse number 10, and he besought him, talking about the demons beseeching Jesus, he besought him much that he would not send him out of the country. I wondered again, why not? You know, if you get out of one person, I thought you can go hop in somebody else or whatever. No, the devil, see, he's got to work. He's got a strategy. He doesn't just wander around doing something crazy. The Bible says he does wander about seeking who he may devour. But he's very strategic, and he's got a work he's doing in this country. He says, don't let me out of this country. I'm working a mischief among the people of Gadara. These aren't, the, these aren't your chosen people. These are just the people of Gadara. I'm, I'm doing a work. I'm doing a mischief. Don't let me out of here. Please, I'm asking you. You can cast me out of this man if you want, but don't send me out of the country. And then he offers a solution. He says, now there was nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, a bunch of hogs, and all the devils besought him, all of them. At first they had like one demon that was speaking in front of them, and now it says that all of them were beseeching Jesus urgently, saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They're all about 2,000, and they choked in the sea. I remember as a, as a young man sitting in Sunday school hearing that story, that's stupid. You want to go get in a bunch of hogs and then go commit suicide? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the devil, have a, the devil has a work. He knows what he's doing. I, I'm amazed at this story. The devil was going to do something. He was going to penetrate this, the people of Gadara, of this country, right where it hurt. These people were Greeks mostly. They're transplants. They, Greeks and uh, Gentiles, they weren't Hebrews. And that's why they had, you know, uh, a herd of hogs. That's something that you wouldn't find among Jewish people. And he's going to attack their industry, attack their business, attack their income, attack their commerce and their trade. This city of Gadara, that, you know, just a few miles away, Gadara, that was built up um, just before the time of Christ. That city was built up, fortified. The name Gadara actually means like a fortress with, a, with high walls around it, just like Jericho would have had. And around that time, you know, they, these cities here in Syria, the, just on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, were built up for the purpose of trade and commerce, trying to keep things flowing through the region. Trade and commerce and income and business meant an awful lot to these people. That's why the devil would attack that. Because this is going to be what I'm going to, I'm going to make it look like you did this. And he penetrates there and goes after it. We see that there's trouble in our country, there's trouble in their country, and the trouble was the devil. And the solution to the trouble is clearly, very clearly, the Lord himself. But we're going to see that not everyone in the country will recognize when the Lord's at work. The Lord has just done an amazing thing. The Lord has removed thousands of demons from one man. It's a miracle that the man's even still alive. He's got something, he just have gone, he's gone through hell on earth, you would almost say. And he's... The, he understood who the Lord was, and he fell at his feet and worshipped him. And the Lord called all the demons out of him and cast them into the, the pigs, the herd of hogs, and they went running. The Bible says that they ran violently. I know that some hogs out in the wild could be pretty violent, but you get 2,000 of them running violently. That's a scary sight for anybody. And they run over the edge, run down a very steep hill, down into the water, down into the sea, and they drown themselves. That's not a normal occurrence. And there were some people that were watching. Verse number 14, and they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city, and were in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting, and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him, 
that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. Not everyone in our country will recognize when the Lord's at work. I believe the Lord's at work today here in America. We just had a great camp last week for our young people. They went. The Lord worked on their heart. I, I can't remember a time where we've had so many testimonies on a Sunday night following a camp. The Lord's at work here in our church. The Lord's at work in our country. I think that there's some good things happening politically. I don't think everything that happens politically in our country is great, but I think the Lord is blessed in a few areas. God's at work. God's doing some great things, but not everybody's willing to recognize that. Not everybody's willing to see that. But it's, it's all about perspective. From the maniac's perspective, Christ had mercy and compassion on him. Who is he? He's just a man that was possessed with multiple demons, and the Lord had mercy and compassion on him and cast all of them out. And then when all the people from the city came, from the, whether it's the local community or Gadara, six miles up the road, when they all came, they saw him sitting at his feet in his right mind, and he was clothed. Something he, those are three things he would never have done back when he was possessed. Yeah. He's sitting. He's, he's under control. He's clothed. He's sitting at Jesus' feet. That, anytime we find somebody sitting at Jesus' feet, it's always an act of worship or an act of just sitting and receiving teaching and instruction from the Lord. The man that has just saved him and done a miraculous work in his, in his own life, he's attached himself to. I want to sit and get everything I can. And isn't that common among us? When someone trusts Christ as Savior, they, they want to get as much as they can. They're in their Bible. They're at church as often as they can be. When the Lord has done something uh, amazing and miraculous in your life, you can't help but get close to God. The Lord took care of his spiritual needs. I, I find it amazing. You know, if, if the Lord taking the demon out of him would be symbolic of salvation, that's not all he did. Right after that, he's sitting and he's teaching and instructing him and working with him, conversing with him. I think that needs to happen in our Christians. With Christians, when someone trusts Christ as Savior, that's not it. That's not the end. They need to grow in Christ. They need to be discipled. They need to be worked with. Their spiritual needs beyond just the salvation. Their spiritual needs and growth. Yeah. The Lord not only met the spiritual needs, he met a physical need too. I don't know where he, he I don't know where the clothes came from, but the Bible says that he was clothed. He was clothed. The Lord just provided what he needed right then and there. And we find that the man of his own free will was willing to sit and stay there. When the men found him, when all the, there was a big crowd of people that came from it. We find that we read in the book of Matthew or Luke that almost the whole city came out. I mean, hundreds, maybe thousands, lots of people were out here looking and observing this man who they all knew was possessed with a demon at one time. And he's sitting in his right mind of his own will at the feet of Jesus, and it just astonished them. They were all afraid. It was scared. From this man's perspective, he sat at his feet worshiping and, and being taught. Even the, the moment of salvation, the Lord is still tending to this man's spiritual needs. He's clothed in his right mind. He wanted to go with Jesus. We're going to see in just a moment. From another perspective, the disciples' perspective, Jesus had just demonstrated his power over 6,000-plus demons, and just a few hours earlier demonstrated his power over all of nature. He has rocked their world. They're like, wow, this is our guy. He's, the Lord is showing himself mighty and strong right there. But not everybody has those perspectives. Yeah. Notice the herdsman's perspective. Someone was frightening and horrible. Six, they saw 2,000 hogs possessed with 6,000 plus demons. They, they, they looked at it. They didn't say, well, the hogs are crazy today. They just ran out and died. That's not exactly what they thought happened. They knew exactly what happened. These hogs were possessed with demons. And they ran violently, very, very fast, to across the edge, and they drowned themselves. That's the only explanation is they were possessed. And over there we saw this man that had just hopped out of the boat, and the maniac was right there. And look at him now. They were frightened. They were afraid. They were just, the, the Bible says that they fled. They didn't say, well, I'm gonna, we're going to go tell our master. They didn't, the Bible didn't say they marched off. They fled. It frightened them. It scared them half to death. And if we, we knew what the devil was up to, it scared us half to death as well. All 2,000 hogs ran violently, and they were gone. From their perspective, the countryman's perspective, it was horrible. From the other people that just show up on the scene that don't know anything about it, they just know that the hog, someone lost 2,000 hogs, and the maniac is uh, not a maniac anymore. They just walk up and see that Christ did what they couldn't do. They tried to help this man. They tried to clothe him. They tried to train him. They tried to bind him. They tried to do what they could do to solve his problems, and nothing would work. And then this stranger, whether they knew who Jesus was or didn't, this stranger has a solution for them. Not everybody's going to be very welcoming when they see the Lord moving. Yeah. And then the hog owners, the Bible doesn't really give a whole lot of specific attention to them. 
But I imagine they were pretty bothered by the fact that their investment in all these in 2,000 uh, pork chops running around here, that they're all gone. <laughs> Not everybody's going to respond the way they ought to when the Lord is moving in our country. The Lord is moving in our midst. Let us not be on the wrong side of that. When the Lord is moving, let us move with him. Let us be responsive to him. Let us be grateful of what he's done. I was in America when I got saved, and I'm thankful for that opportunity. I was in America when the Lord called me to preach. I'm thankful for that. God has done some great things for me in America, and I'm very thankful. We should all be thankful. Let us all be, be quick to remember, as the maniac was, of what the Lord has done. Let us stay at his feet, stay close, and ready to receive it. Not only do we see that the, there's a problem in our country, God's the answer to our problems. Not everybody likes it when God gets involved. But when the Lord is at work in a country, it's going to make some people uncomfortable. It's, let me rephrase that a little bit. When the Lord's at work in our church, it's going to make some people uncomfortable. When the Lord's at work in our homes, in my specific life, I'm going to get uncomfortable because the Lord is rocking the boat. He is changing everything that we thought was normal. He's taking our normal everyday life and he's changing it up. He's adding conviction. He's moving. These people were scared. The Bible says that, um, look with me if you would. The Bible says in verse 15, and they come to Jesus. They came, they wanted to see Jesus. These, the, the herdsmen of the pigs came and told them what happened to the pigs. They didn't want, the Bible doesn't say that they went and saw that there were no pigs anymore. They didn't go over to the edge of the sea. Oh, yep, there's, look at all that pork. It's a shame. It's a waste. They didn't, they didn't go to that. They wanted to see the man that cast all these demons out. The Bible says they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. That's a great name. See, he doesn't have a name per se like Braden or Danny or Donovan. He does, the Bible doesn't give his name like that. But now he went from being the man with an unclean spirit to the man that had been possessed. He's not possessed anymore. They come there. They see him. They see him sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And what does it say right there at the very end of the verse? What's that last, those last three words? They were afraid. I, I don't understand that. When you see something amazing happen, like a man with thousands of demons that you could not control suddenly get neutralized and the Lord just change him, makes him a normal man and has done a miraculous work right there, why would you be afraid of that? As I look at this word, this, this word afraid does include fear, but it also means just astonishment, blown away. You know, you've been afraid of something. I think as a little kid, afraid of fireworks. The fireworks aren't going to hurt you. But as a little kid, I remember being afraid that the fireworks were going to come down and burn my head or something. Being just, I was over at a sand nets game back when they used to be the sand nets. And sitting there, they shoot fireworks. And I got all afraid just because it, it, it was so astonishing and scary at the same time. These people didn't know what to think. God has just done an amazing work. And they're scared. They really don't understand what God's doing. And by the way, lost people are going to have a hard time understanding what God's up to because to them it's foolishness. If you're, if you're here and you're lost today, I, I don't mean to be insulting at all. If somebody's here and they don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior, you have the opportunity to get saved today and understand these things. But the, the people were scared. They didn't understand. The people were also intimidated. The Lord's presence was disturbing their normal. My normal everyday life includes a maniac way out in the tomb somewhere screaming, and I'm walking over here to feed the pigs. And now the pigs are gone, and this man's normal. I don't like it, God. People got all upset. They were intimidated. Wait a minute. You're changing everything. You're changing my business. You're changing my income. You're changing my way of life. You're changing what I'm used to. And many times when God moves, he's going to shake it up. We need to respond the right way. People are angered when the Lord's movement costs them. I guarantee you the man who owned all those pigs was very upset. I guarantee it. The countryman's response to their fear and their discomfort was to ask or pray. The Bible says literally in verse number um, 17, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. They began to pray that he would depart out of their coasts. They prayed for him to leave. They just begged him, please. They didn't want to make him mad. They just like, we just don't want you here. Please just go back to where you came from. Now, does that sound like our country? Our country is actually to the point now where we're saying we don't want you, we don't want you, we don't want you, and pushing God, throwing God out as much as we can. But it didn't start there. It didn't start so aggressive. It started way back many years ago when it was just a little more comfortable. Just we don't want God here. He can be over there somewhere else. We just don't want him here. That's not the way it should be. These people in this nation are disturbed and uncomfortable with God's moving, and they just say, please, God, just go away. 
just go away, please. We, you know, they're trying to be nice and gentle about it, but they don't even understand that they're pushing away the solution to all their problems. They're pushing away blessing. I guarantee you there were people in those cities and those villages that were lame or that were blind, that were full of disease. They needed God's hand of touch on their life, but the people were so disturbed by whatever they didn't like that made them uncomfortable that they pushed God away, and it cost them. They were a community built around trade and commerce, as I said. They were, they'd rather have a maniac and his demons than have Christ and his miracles. That blows my mind. But people just don't understand. Yeah. When, God's, when God is moving, it's, it's easy to get caught up in what it costs us or what's different. It's easy to get wrapped up in that. But let's not be, be wrapped up in that. Let's be focused on the Lord. You know who enjoyed and we're actually uh, happy about what just happened were the people that were close to Jesus, the disciples and the maniac. They were right there. They're like, hey, this is great. Let's go down the road and do it, do it to somebody else. Let's just keep it going. But when the Lord's at work in our country, here in America, here in Richmond Hill, it's going to be uncomfortable to somebody. I hope that if it's uncomfortable to you, you don't act as this nation did, as this country, these people, and they just ask God to leave, try to get them out of there, pray that we wouldn't respond like that. Not only that, but when the Lord is pushed out of our country, it's still time for his people to testify and obey the Lord's command. This is what he says. Look with me again in verse number 17. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. And hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. These, this country pushed God out, but whether they, whether they welcomed him or they pushed him out, regardless of that, it was time for those who had been affected by God, the ones whose a miracle had taken place in their life, to stand up and testify. It was time for that. Jesus was pushed out. He was asked to leave. He, and the, the maniac, the man who had just gotten saved, the Bible refers to him as the man who had been possessed. He's not possessed anymore. God's done a, a miracle in his own heart and life. That man is now wanting to go with God. He wanted to be with God whether the, whether the Lord would stay in his country or leave. He says, I just want to be with you. He was content with leaving behind friends and family and following the Lord. I admire his dedication. But the Lord called him to something. He says, I want you to go home, go to your friends, and tell them of the, the great things that I have done for you. But it's not, that's not all he said. Tell them of my great compassion. He said, you tell them. He said, I don't want you to just tell them about the fact that you used to have demons and someone came along and took your demons away. He said, I want them to understand that I love them very, very much. I want them to understand that I have power over everything. He's probably sitting there talking, and the disciples are like, hey, maniac you know what uh he just calmed like a storm the other day while we were coming over here it's pretty embarrassing for us because we didn't trust him but it was pretty awesome seeing him do it you know he's, he's sitting there learning and receiving all this instruction from the lord he just wants to be close to the lord and the lord says no i want you to go and testify when the lord's been pushed out of our country god's people need to testify anyway when the lord's been pushed out of our community we need to testify anyway young people when god's pushed out of your school you get to testify anyway the Bible says not only testify, but go and obey. The Lord gave him instruction. It says, go home to thy friends. Yeah. The people that care about you, they cared about you back before you had the demon. The one that would actually care to see you again, they're like, hey, he says, go back to them. You have a testimony that's going to impact them more than some stranger over here. So you go back to them and you witness to them. And that's what he did. That's not all he did, though. Praise the Lord. This man, I wish I knew his name, but the man who had been possessed with the devil is no longer possessed anymore. The Bible says that he not only went back home and told his friends and family, but he went to a place called Decapolis. Decapolis isn't one place. Decapolis means ten cities. And that one city, the city of Gadara, was one of those ten cities. And he goes to every single city, and he's proclaiming of what Jesus has done in his own life. Yeah, he used to have 6,000 or more demons wrapped up in his, inside of him, possessing him, controlling him, doing horrible things. He shows them the scars from when he cut himself. He shows them all the bruises, all the horrible markings all over his body that the devil used to abuse him. He tells them about all the horrible things that the devil did controlling him and how the devil was working in the land of Gadara. And he points over and says, you see what the devil's doing here and the devil's doing here. God did something for me and got rid of the devil. 
And the Lord is full of compassion. He wants to do it for you. He goes around to every single city in Decapolis, 10 major cities, and proclaims, the Bible says, and all people did marvel. They all marveled. They all blew away. Now, those same people that were seemingly said, God, just leave our coast. Just leave. Just, you, you can go somewhere else. Just not here. Those same people, when he goes and he reminds them, hey, the Lord did this for me. Jesus, the son of the most high God, he did this. He saved me. He did a miraculous work in my life. All men did marvel. The Bible doesn't say that they all got saved, but they were all made aware of it because this man, the Bible says he used the word publish. That's rooted in the Greek word called keruzo, and keruzo means to preach. He went preaching in all of these ten cities and was just lighting it up, telling people about what the Lord has done. Among these ten cities, there's two that really stand out to me. I learned about one of them in Brother Nick's class when I was in VBS. I have a handicap. I, there's certain books of the Bible that I don't like to read, and Brother Nick brought up one of them. It was uh, Revelation. He talked about the different churches that were mentioned in Revelation, the Lord's work. And what was that one church that the Lord just greatly blessed? Philadelphia. Philadelphia was one of those ten cities that this man went to. He goes and he's preaching among all ten cities, and one of them happens to be Philadelphia. And just a few years after this man who used to be possessed with a devil comes along, Along, I mean, just a few years after he's come and he's ministered there and he's talked about God's compassion and his great works and his love, there would be other Christians that would be fleeing in persecution and they'd go and they would establish a church right there. And that church would stay true all the way till the end of the Apostle John's days, back when he would write. So for like, I'd say 50 plus years later, we got a solid church right here in a big city of Philadelphia. That's amazing. And then there's also the city of Damascus. That city was also one of these ten cities that um, this man who had been possessed with the devil, he goes to Damascus. And the, what do we know about Damascus? That's the city that the apostle Paul would go. Back when he was Saul, he would go and he would, portray, he would try to catch these Christians that are running away. He's trying to persecute them. Damascus was, was known as one of those cities that Christians could flee to. And there's a man there by the name of Ananias. Ananias. And Ananias, he's a Christian. The gospel has reached all these cities. I believe that this man that had been possessed with the devil, but is no longer possessed with the devil, he's possessed with the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going and proclaiming his compassion and his great works. I believe that that man just was like a forerunner for the gospel, just going and talking about Jesus. All these Gentiles and these people that didn't know who Jesus was, he's going and telling them all about them. So when someone comes through with the gospel, they're sitting and they're receiving it, and they're hearing it, and they're saying, I want that, I need that. And God started moving. That's what we need. In our country today, we need Christians that will say, I'll stand up and testify what God has done for me, what God has done in my life, what God has done in my family, in my church. I'm not going to be quiet about it. And I'm not going to sit still and just tell my family. Friend, I'm going to go and tell the other cities. I'm going to tell the other people all around me. We need God to get a hold of us and just do what he will with us. This man was a, obedient and willing to do whatever God said. It started with a desire to just be with God. And God took that desire and said, I'm going to bless it. You do what I say. Testify and go. Go and testify. That's what he did. And he told him what to testify about, and he did it. It's amazing. All men marveled at what this man's testimony was. But we see, talking about this nation of Gadara, this country, this region, this city of Gadara, the, the people, the very people that would reject Christ and would say, no, we don't want you here. Please leave. You really messed up our lives because we were doing pretty good without you. Those same people missed out on a huge blessing. So we see that our country, this country, America, Gadara, they have problems, and the devil is the root of the problems. We see that this country, the problems, the only solution is Jesus Christ himself. Some people don't understand when God's going to move, and when he does move, it's very uncomfortable and when God is even pushed out of our country, Christians have the responsibility to stand up and testify and proclaim the Lord. Yes. But lastly, as I wrap this up, there is always another country on the other side welcoming the Lord to work in their country. Look with me in verse number 20 and 21, talking about the maniac again. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And this is what Jesus did in verse number 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, where he just left the day before, crossed, goes back right over there. He's not talking about Gadara. He's leaving Gadara, crossing back to the, the west side of the Sea of Galilee. 
what are those next two words, words after uh, Jesus passed over again by ship unto the other side? The next two words say, much people, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. As he was nigh unto the sea, he's still way out in the ocean. They're like, that's Jesus. We got to get everybody. That's Jesus. Bring the sick. Bring the dead. Bring the people. We need Jesus right here. The nation of Gadara, there was no welcome party. They didn't know he was coming. And once they knew he was there, they didn't welcome him. They didn't want him to stay. If our nation, if any nation says, I don't want God, there'll be a nation somewhere else that says we do. Our nation used to be that nation that says we want God. We, our country is built upon principles found in God's word. I was reading quotes today by John Adams, and he just says our country wouldn't be what it's supposed to be if we weren't built on biblical principles. There were Christian men that founded this country, ones that were committed to just a life of holiness and living for the Lord. The, our nation used to be for many, many years, a nation says we want God. And we were the ones sending out missionaries more than anybody else. There were great churches and great revivals that happened in our country. But now we've gone to the point where we're, we're content with pushing God aside. And because our country is like that, that just means that our small towns, our large towns, our homes, many of us, many different units, we're all just content with pushing God aside. Let me live my life. Here today on Independence Day, as we think about how great it is to be an American, it may not be great too much longer if we decide we're going to live our lives without God. If we push God away, it is so important that when the Lord is working, Friend, we got revivals coming up. We got Saturday night revival starting in just a few weeks. And then we got another like half week revival plan over the Jake DeAndre in August. We got things lined up. Young people, you guys just had like a revival at camp. The Lord is working. Let's not throw that away. When the Lord works, let's be sensitive. Let's receive it. Let's take hold on it. And if you if you want that, you're gonna have to be like the maniac and by, like the disciples. They just got close to God. We all have a responsibility to testify and lift up the name of Christ of what he's done for us. I hang my head in shame. I don't tell people enough. I don't want us to be a Gadara that is content with God moving on to another country, to cross, and cross over to the other side, go somewhere else. I need God to work right here. I need God to work in my heart and my life. And I pray the same for you. Let's bow our heads as we pray. As we wrap this up.